Hold My Cutter coming your way, as always, from Burn by Rocky Patel, just a couple of blocks away from PNC Park on the North Shore, seven days a week, 2 p.m. to 2 a.m., just uh, enjoying some premium cigars. And as always, we want to thank Jim Fisher, the GM, and Assistant uh, General Manager Ken Stout for today's featured smoke by Rocky Patel, the white label, Connecticut wrapper, Nicaraguan binder with the Honduran filler. Uh, Michael McHenry, a slight nutty taste, a hint of peppercorn, creamy, smoothie taste, and just a really good, smooth smoke. And we always enjoy these tremendous stogies from Burn by Rocky Patel, don't we? We, we do, and with my catcher's mitt right here, Brownie. I saw that. I kind of wish I would have caught with one in my mouth at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Like, back there, Matt. We'll work on that, Fort. We're going to work on that. <laughs> you know, when we last left you, by the way, we were getting into uh, Michael McHenry this episode. Seven years in the big leagues, three years with the Pirates, three years with the Rockies, a little bit of time with the St. Louis Cardinals and the Majors. Seventh round pick of the Colorado Rockies in 2006. Made his Major League debut September of 2010. And we were leading up to, we were teasing this incredible moment. And your career is filled with some wild uh, coincidences, I think. And this one for sure, because we talked about for your first hit in the big leagues was with the Pirates. Your first big league home run came July 8th, 2011, PNC Park. It's your 19th major league start. You had been acquired June the 12th. Again, you had made some starts with the Pirates. and But your big moment comes on this day at PNC Park. It's a Friday night, over 37,000 fans. The Pirates, you could tell, were turning, just starting to turn the corner. You could just tell. They were three games over 500. Think about that. July 8, 2011, they had sniffed 500 for years. So now we set the stage, stage. James McDonald is on the hill for the Pirates against Rodrigo Lopez. Pirates are trailing 3-2 to two in the bottom of the sixth inning. Andrew McCutcheon hits a home run that ties it. Then in the top of the eighth, Darwin Barney of the Cubs, an RBI single off Jose Barros, to give the Cubs a 4-3 lead. So you can just sense now people in the ballpark are kind of down. They were f fired up that Barris would hold the lead. They give it up. The bottom of the eighth inning, lefty Sean Marshall on the mound for the Cubbies. He faces pinch hitter Matt Diaz. Diaz draws a walk. Kutch follows, flies out. Neil Walker, ground ball, fielder's choice. So Walker's on. Now left-handed batter for the Pirates, Lyle Overbay faces the lefty Sean Marshall. Overbay, a base hit, first and second, two outs. Manager for the Cubs that year and that day was Mike Quaddy, who brings in their lights-out guy, the right-hander Carlos Marmol, who gives up an RBI single to Josh Harris and Jay Hay, ties the game. Now that's a, a, a long preview of what's about to occur because of this moment, Michael McHenry, it's an 0-2 count. We're going to set this tonight. I've got this here on YouTube. We're, you and I are going to watch it here in a moment. But I'm sure you remember it like it was yesterday. I do. How I do. nervous were you coming up to the plate in this situation? I mean, think about all the names you just mentioned. I didn't think I was going to hit that inning. Yeah. You know, I have my shin guards on. I'm getting a game plan going back out, thinking, hey, we're going to come back. But then you see things start to happen and unfold. So you start playing that game out in your mind and, you know, when I get on deck and Jay Hay gets that hit, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's go time. And I get up there, you know, really with no expectations, but have a good at bat, you know, try to continue this inning on. Yeah, but you're down two strikes. I get down two do, strikes. Do you remember any, fast. anything about slider, yeah. slider, slider? Really, slider. really so good like, slider, fell off a slider. And then. You remember that? I do. I do. I don't remember anything preceding that. Huh. How that inning kind of came about, I have no clue. But well, the first pitch you said you fouled off a slider. First pitch I took. Strike. And then, yes, and then the next now one the I ended up seeing that. And, then, and now what are you thinking? What's in your mind now? I'm battling. So I spread out, and I'm like, all right, he's got a nasty slider. He loves throwing it. I think he threw it like 70-plus percent of the time. So I'm just sitting there like fouling ball off after ball off after ball off. I think it was a 10-pitch at bat. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was a wild at bat. Wow, so you kept, kept fouling off slider after it. slider. Yeah, he just kept going to it. And finally, he hung one, and I got it. Okay, so let's let's watch it together now. Uh, it's 0 and 2, 10 pitch at bat. And, and 
Me really do want to. Here it goes. <laughs> I love that. For me, Brownie, that call. First in the big leagues, your first home run in the big leagues gives yeah. the Pirates a 7 4 lead, eighth inning, two outs. And it really, I, I, that just came to mind. They're going to bring the house down because this moment, you could again tell it was like the Pirates coming out party. Now, you don't get many curtain calls in your career, not many players ever do. But they're the, your teammates. Yeah. A hug from Kutch. They want the, the. You get the curtain call. You barely sheepishly go to the second step. Yeah, doctor helmet. Yeah, because it didn't seem real. I mean, if you watch me round the bases right there, Brownie. Right. Um, I kind of have a a a straight face. Like, didn't even really hit me until I started slapping hands, and my teammates were right there. I have a picture. And I'm just like, oh, and I hit over base so hard because it was such a moment that like it was surreal round of the bases. Didn't even feel like I was touching the ground. I touch home, but it's when I saw Jay Hay and over Bay and, and Wait, Pedro waiting, for, you at home waiting for me that it really hit me. And then the fans, you know, <laughs> screaming and yelling and then saying, let's go Bucks." That was the moment. And then obviously all the guys loving on me. Kutch gave me that big hug. And then him and over Bay, and I'm sure it was Diaz kind of pushed me up and I, I didn't even really know what to do. And I had my helmet and I just tipped my cap. Maybe they, maybe they reminded me to, I have no idea, but they felt like that was the moment, you know, Hey, get out there and do your thing. And something you'll never forget. I wondered that when a player has that moment, when you're in the dugout and you're high-fiving and hugging, when, when we're up there in the booth and we can sense the fans, they have that sense that they want, it's like a, a concert, you know, um, that you you wanted that that band to come back out uh, now that's pre-planned this of course is not and when you're in the dugout and getting the high fives and the hugs can you hear any of that or was it the teammates that hear it and they get push you out it ha it was the teammates I mean it was such a surreal moment for me it almost gives me like an unreal emotional feel after the fact like watching it now I just got chills yeah um and there's been times where people have surprised me, whether it's an event I spoke at, they play this, and they talk about where they were in the, in the stands. Wow. And a lot of times it's a father and a son or a father and a daughter. Or maybe it's a mom and a daughter or mom and a son. And I've heard so many stories about moments and just small, small moments in time that have meant so much where they become a Pirates fan for life or they become a Michael McHenry fan, which is absolutely humbling. Or like one of the best calls, in my opinion – in all sports history is based around that and a couple others that you've had brownie that solidify a moment that you can never forget it's ingrained in my mind every time i go back to it my heart starts fluttering i get those goosebumps uh i had a kid called chicken skin get uh. chicken skin and you do and then you remember you know all the little like i don't know how to say it all the little uh moments that you had by watching it that you didn't remember Right. I didn't remember Kutch. All comes that, back to you. Yeah, yeah I didn't yeah. remember Kutch giving me that big hug yep. until I rewatched it. And that's what's cool about reflecting on your career. And I don't think as players now, they don't take enough time doing they they dig themselves, but they don't take enough time saying what a what a moment that was. Yeah. Like embrace that. And I think a lot of times that'll enhance people's career. But that right there made me not just fall in love with my team even more, but the city, you, Walkie, and just the winning effect, Pittsburgh, like gets when when they know something good's coming yeah and then that they sense that they amazing. knew that the the big bad cubs beating up on the pirates for years that that now that swing kind of hands it to the cubs and maybe everybody is awakened to know that the pirates are now on the cusp of being a, a, a really good team and and we're not going to be pushed around anymore in our home ballpark yeah we had a fight in us yeah right? and, and you name some of those names i mean they sign over bay to a pretty good contract diaz to a pretty good contract but you, you mentioned Neil Walker, who was a couple years in, uh, Pedro Alvarez, a couple years in, who came off in, in that year, really, really struggled. So he had some moments. And then Jay Hay, you know, a huge year in AAA, Alex Presley, also part of it. But a lot of names that nobody knew that were just kind of fighters, grinders, gritty players. And I felt like that was a moment where 
they saw the identity coming together with the Well, the thing about it, too, in a previous episode, we talked about the eight catchers the Pirates used that year. So you, you even being a Pirate was incredible that you ended up getting there. Less than a month into your Pirate career, you hit your first Major League home run. Again, it beats the Chicago Cubs. Felt like Cubs. it took forever, though, Brownie. Yeah, I'm sure Man, it, it felt. 19 where, by the way, felt like 19,000. Where, where is the ball? It's at home. But where have, specifically? It, it's in my basement. Um, I have a giant collection of signed balls, and it's one of the ones I have kind of off to the side. But my wife also got the print of contact of when I made the like actual contact of, of when uh, I believe it was Neil Walker and A.J. Burnett ended up putting cream in my no, – not A.J., A.J. was next year. Uh, there's Neil Walker put the shaving cream in my face. I wish it was whipped cream. It cream <laughs> did not taste very good. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, those are things you want to kind of reflect on, look back on, and, and never forget. And so often I think you do the same thing. We don't do it a good enough job of remember where we came yeah. from. And that was special. Appreciate the moment. Did you know right away, by the way, when that ball left the bat? Like you hadn't hit a home run in the big leagues. You're at PNC Park. It's a tough place to hit home runs. Drive the ball to left field, and that was deep beyond the wall but did you know immediately it was gone i did i did but i didn't want to believe it until it actually hit and what everybody went nuts because you know we, when you hit a homer I always say you got to know your pop yeah right even though i i felt like i did that was a moment i was going to take off so hard <laughs> and you, so fast to first base and yeah, not yeah, not, not look at, at all. it not think <laughs> about it just get there and let it happen because if it didn't go Something weird happened. Gust of wind. I don't know. Michael, you didn't drop the never. bat. You didn't flip the bat. You didn't know nothing. No. Mm -mm. Oh, we can never go back and look at that moment, that bat flip. No bat flip. It's so nope. great to see a really nope. cool bat but flip. I, but I did hover around the bases. I don't even think I touched. So I did something cool at least. Uh, what was a number of reasons why that moment stands out and will stand the test of time. In all the years of PNC Park, there are seminal moments that take place. That one certainly, for those reasons we talked about. And you're uh, less than a month in your Pirates career. How the fans embraced you, that kind of puts you on the, the Pirate fans map. And and really, they, they, they kind of knew the, the nickname already. Uh, now, it was reinforced that maybe hardcore fans knew the Fort nickname, which brilliant Bob talked about early on in your career. Like, he's a catcher. He blocks Fort McHenry, Baltimore. How, how perfect that is. But that kind of made you almost a cult figure. I don't, I don't know about that. I think you guys helped, you know, bring love around players that played a certain way. You know, Jay Hay was beloved here. Kutch was beloved here. Guys that just had, you know, the attitude that embraced the city. I think, and I felt like they adopted me. I felt like I was a child of Pittsburgh that didn't know it yet. Yeah. And there's a Clemente quote, quote that said, I wasn't born here, but this is my home. And that's kind of mm -hmm. how I feel. I feel like it's been, Somewhere that's embraced me when I left the game playing wise. It was one of the first cities that popped in my head. And of course, someone calls and asks if I'd like to take that job with AT&T. And it was it wasn't even hesitation of, of like, yeah, I'd love to go back to Pittsburgh. Obviously, there's a lot more that goes into it. But it's because of the way the fans embrace me, the team, you guys in the front office and in the booth, because that's not normal. I, yeah. I don't know if people know that fans know that, that you can go to a team and never meet the president, never meet the owner. I mean, when you come to the Pirates, you meet the owner, you meet the president, you meet just about everybody. They come up and shake your hand, make you feel like a normal human being. Mm -hmm. And the fans, some of the best and most respectful fans on the planet. You know, going to dinner with, with Pedro or Kutch, people see them and they want to come and talk to them. But they'll lay back and they just wait for a moment. And sometimes you know that they want to come up. So there was times where they, like, hey, Kutch, go say hello that person and cut you back. Hey, I think they're trying to get a hold of you this time. It was so cool because that wasn't normal. Most places they just jump out at you here. There's a different type of respect for their Pittsburgh people. Yeah. And I think that's really, really yeah, they, they, they do embrace you, especially if you're one of their own and you've made you and Jack have made Pittsburgh your home. By the way, I, I think I recall you actually made a visit to uh, Fort McHenry in Baltimore. Did. Didn't you when the pirates were there? I did. I got shortly to raise thereafter. the flag. You did. Yeah. Yeah, well, Baltimore was, Harbor. Yeah, I got to look back at that when we played Baltimore this year. Um, oh, that's Adam neat. Elmore grabbed the film and put it oh. put it in the broadcast. We used it in the pregame. Yeah, you talk about a moment and, and being a, a guy that loves the military and has always been a part of 
a lot of different military charities and have a lot of friends that have served, that was special. Like that, that goes down with any home run, with any moment I had on the field because of what that represents. I mean, we're not free. Right. If that flag doesn't hold, yep. we're not free. And also finding out from you and, and walking and his love for like history, r- really just the history of the military, military complex, all of it made it even more special. I mean, Star Spangled Banner. Exactly. Born there. So cool. Uh, how about nicknames? You love nicknames, don't you? I do love nicknames. You fire them out there. I do. And part of it's because when I was a kid, I couldn't re- re- remember people's names. <laughs> and it kind of like stuck. You know, you try to figure out you know, who is this guy? What, what, you know, what does he represent? And then you find it like Jack Swinsky, I call Sh- Sunshine. He reminds me of the guy That's from great. Uh, um, that movie. And you all forever will call Brownie. Yeah. You know, and you just kind of, you know, find something that fits. And if, they don't get offended by it. You run with it. Well, it's funny too because nicknames over the years, it, a lot of a lot of years ago, decades ago, the, uh, the the gunner, a nickname, Bob Prince, a uh, Hall of Fame broadcaster, one of the more iconic voices in baseball history. He used to love tagging guys with with nicknames, and those stuck for a long, long time. Uh, his his partner was Jim Woods for a while. The possum he called. <laughs> but uh, the kitten Harvey Haddix, uh, it, it, you know, nicknamed him, and, and and it went on and on. Doctor Strange Glove was the first baseman, it. Dick Stewart, because he was so bad defensively at first base. <laughs> no, but you know, back then, for yeah. back then, players were never offended by things like that. Right. You could outwardly say it, but now, I remember. Uh, I don't think he'll mind me telling this. I don't think he will. If he will kill me, if he, but uh, <laughs> we'll find out. One of my favorite <laughs> players to 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 watch over the years at PNC Park, and it, people have asked me uh, the best all-around player that I've seen. Now Andrew McCutcheon, probably at the top of the list because he had, and he's still not necessarily at the top of his game as he was ten years ago. But you know, for that stretch, there was nobody hotter, and in, in, for like yeah. for a three-year stretch was Andrew McCutcheon. But a guy who could hit for power. Didn't have the greatest arm in the world, but uh, uh, well above average speed, knew the game, knew the strike zone, did everything, was a baseball junkie, ran the bases great, was Brian Giles. And w- when he first came on board, he was running around the outfield. He played some center and left, a little bit of right. And one of the first things I did, he looked like an animal running around out there. So I kind of started calling him the animal, and he told me that his wife didn't care for that, so I, I backed down off that. But but there's a sensitivity you level. You think he took it home? I bet he took it home. Maybe, but, but that's why she didn't like it. It seems hey, yeah. He and the yeah. animals. Yeah, yeah, now. that's right. Yeah. That's right. Animals but, home. But yeah. it seems like like players are a little more sensitive to it, and so you have to be judicious maybe with the calls. I think Jacob Stallings liked it when you called him the cheetah. It's kind of I, I, a I, bit I, of an I, ironic I was, name. Yeah, I yeah. flirted with that. I wasn't sure. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't kind didn't of embrace show it like you yeah. embraced yeah. Fort. I was like, come on, you're so good in that yeah. that six foot window. Let's just. Run with it. But uh, anyway, that, that's, I think, w- one of the episodes down the road, we're going to do just like a whole episode of, of nicknames yes. because there have been some classic nicknames over the years, uh, especially in, in, uh, in Pirates history. You talked about, and I hear this from players who hit maybe game-winning walk-off hits, but especially the, the home runs and your home run. Uh, John Wayner hit the last home run ever in the one history of, cool of Three Rivers Stadium. Yeah. Uh, that's a long story. We'll get rock. Uh, we'll be uh, part of uh, Hold My Cutter Incredible for a, an episode in itself. But that home run for me was the greatest I've ever witnessed or called because of all that it entailed being the last game ever in the history of Three River Stadium and a carrot kid who grew up a pirate, stealer, penguin fanatic, and who just had a kind of a no disrespect, he would say it, I'm sure, middling career, 10 years and bounced around, you know, different positions, but didn't even start all that many games in his career. He had a total of four home runs in a 10-year career and happened to hit the last home run ever in the history of Brewer Stadium. Just incredible. But again, he said about kind of floating around the bases. Maz talks about that, right. hitting the last home run, the walk-off home run, 1960, maybe the greatest home run in the history of baseball to beat the Yankees, but how they they floated. And you guys have talked for it about how things slow down for you when you're in that zone. And in a weird sense, for me as a broadcaster, t- 
time almost stood still because I remember that ball that Wayner hit. It was a line drive home run of a left field wall at Three River Stadium off a former pirate. John Lieber was pitching for the Chicago I mean, you can't Cubs. Make that no. That's the craziest part is that you start putting these yeah. pieces of the puzzle yeah, together. Yeah. You're like, How does that how work? Does this yeah. happen? You can't write that script. Yeah, that's why baseball is such a oh, romantic sport. That's why it's the best of all <laughs> it really is. for so many reasons. But this these things like that that we're pointing out can happen. And here's Lieber delivering this pitch. Wainer's home run gives the Pirates the lead. It turns out to be the last home run ever. But I remember 60,000 fans at, at Three River Stadium, the last game ever they'll witness baseball game there, and where everything just kind of quieted down. It just, like, like, everything went blank. And all I could see was this Kara kid running around the bases. For me, he was going in slow motion. Uh, it's just a weird feeling, a weird moment, isn't it, where, where you're in that zone? Yeah, and I, I'll never forget when you told me this story. You got, you've gotten to tell it, the short version, the long version, and you and Walk were kind of talking about, like, what if? Yeah. Like, and what we talked if? Before the, well, we saw Wayner in the uh, – oh, I had known, not a home run guy. No, like a total of four home not runs in his career. Not the minor leagues, not no, the big no, leagues, not at all, no, four. Uh, he hit four home runs in his entire career, but he was the, – the thing that was cool was he was in the starting lineup that day because I never do this. Which is feel. For me, like, we, we talk about Gene Lamont had Yeah, feel. like having feel the of, manager. like, the moment. Yep. This moment, this makes sense. This kid has been – Pirates and Cubs are out of the race. Could not pick it better. Uh, let's, let's put him – so I go in at the clubhouse at, at Three River Stadium. As soon as you walk in, it was that, that uh, cork board, and they would stick the lineup up there on the left-hand side. As soon as you walked in, so you could see it. And I run through the lineup, and I see Wayner, third base. How cool is that? Way to go, Gino, Gene Lamont. Yep. Like, you get it. Yep. Uh, put this Pittsburgher in for this moment. And uh, and I never do this, but I had a, a big uh, scorecard uh, uh, made of heavy construction paper. And I went around and had each player sign his position. It's the only thing I think I've ever kept, memento. Just thought it'd be kind of a neat thing. Because that, that was kind of where I grew up, at Three River Stadium. That Which was, we're going to get into. It was my ballpark. You had a cool story too, Brian. Well, anyway, it was, it was neat. Uh, so I go around to each position and have the guy sign. I go to, to Rock Wiener, whom I had known because he was up and down. I was in Buffalo in the minor leagues when he was coming up, and, and I was there for five years. And not only did I see him come up for the first time, but I see him come back down again and again. <laughs> yep. and he, and again but, yeah. but, but I loved his story, and uh, so we were kind of buddies, and uh, I sat there at his locker and had him sign. I said, how cool is it that Gino has you in the starting lineup? And he kind of chuckled. Yeah, they're kind of, you know, kidding me. I should have hit a home run. And we <laughs> laughed and uh, chuckled and shook his hand, went upstairs. I go into the press room. We're having dinner before the game. And I happen to be on TV that night with Steve Blass and Nellie King, a former pirate and a longtime broadcast teammate of Bob Prince in the heyday of the 70s. And they decided, which was smart on their part, to have Steve – former pirate pitcher who was a great pitcher in the 70s got the pirates of the 71 world series those two big games and then nelly and they were kind of spinning tails uh, the, the booth tv booth at three rivers was located on the fourth level the radio booth behind home plate on the third level and he just took a, a, a little couple flights of stairs to get up quickly to each level up and down and i was having dinner with bob that night who was a teammate of John's, of course, in the early 90s. And we're talking how cool it was he's in the lineup. And I mentioned that they're kidding him that he should hit a home run. And Walkie said, oh, would that be unbelievable? Yeah, it'd be cool. You know, just the fact that he's starting is great. Well, after the home run is hit, and now, of course, I'm going crazy. I love I take my headset off, and and Steve Blass and Nellie King are there alongside. I just am shaking my head. I can't believe it. It's between innings, so you got a couple of minutes to try it. I turn around and look at who had made his way up those two flights of stairs from the radio booth to the back of the TV booth. There's Bob Walk <laughs> with tears in his eyes. And I jump up out of my chair and I jump into his arms. And we, I, it was like the seventh game of the World Series. We're both bawling, you know, crying and, and just loving that moment. And so for a number of reasons, of course, uh, that, that stands out for me. But you weren't done. But, Brownie, with, real quick. Yeah. The coolest part about that is is that could have been the biggest moment. It probably is the biggest moment in Rock's career. The one yeah. he remembers more than anything. And same thing with you guys. Like, 
the hope is, yeah, we win a World Series. Yeah. You call it. People go nuts. We're crying, and it's just the city just goes bonkers. But those moments you don't want to forget because they only exist once, right? That's right. right. And, and it's and special, and it you can't draw it up. And you know, knowing the relationship all you guys have now, thinking back all the way to then, and you know how it kind of manifested. You know, former teammate, you're a Pittsburgh fan your entire life. You're watching this kid fight and claw. Who's from Pittsburgh? Gritty, hard nosed. Literally, he's called the Rock for a reason. Yeah, and he does something that nobody could have drawn up. I mean, there's a chance he didn't even start, but the feel of the the manager to understand that this is a moment this kid needs to play. It's his last chance to play to a place that was pretty much heaven to him yes. as a kid. He'd ride the bus or the trolley, yep. or whatever, to get there. That is such an incredible thing because you're right. Like you're such into that moment, and I love how you said how slow it was in that moment. You know, the ball's coming in. He makes contact. It's like the ball's like a, I don't know. Well, like, yeah, when it's I, leaving the bat. I, I like, think about Sandlot when it's like. Yeah, ooh, when it's, it's exactly ooh, right. When it's slow. leaving the bat, like my first thought is, and no it, it happens in seconds, <laughs> but my thought is, is, does this have a chance to leave the ball? Could this be a home run? <laughs> this is impossible have to believe. Have you gone back and listened to your call? I've heard it because, uh, yeah, 93.7 The Fan, when John does a, a weekly show and they'll they'll replay that. So, I, I, I yeah, I hear it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but but I, I've talked to Rock about that. In fact, I've introduced him at, at events and, you know, he gets he's not a guy that gets teary eyed very no. often. No. But he admits that when, when that moment when he reflects, he does. And he said he's never cried on the baseball field, except when he went out back to third base after the home run that gave the Pirates the lead in the top of the inning. He goes out there and the crowd goes crazy when he was and he said that's when he was really he says i can't see because i got tears i don't want to you know wipe them yeah because i don't want people to know yep. i'm a tough guy yep. and I, had, I had one of those moments in my career same thing yeah when it, i'm sure we'll get to it but the blackout game for me when i walked out the introduction the introduction um i had been on the, the field the months, reaction yeah i'm in the field a month and a half two months what did happen why there was a standing ovation. and No, you, had old, you been hurt? Yeah, I'd been oh, hurt. Oh, I didn't realize that. Just started walking off crutches, and they're like, hey, we, we're going to introduce you. you got to go out. Don't run. So everyone else is jogging out. I'm walking out. So it's an extended period of time, and they're going ballistic the entire time. And then I get to the end, and they do it again, and tears are just Come falling on. on my face. Yeah, because, like, when you're on the DL, I was always taught you don't exist. My, I remember a college coach telling me that. And even being in the meetings, you know, talking to teammates, you know, doing everything I can possibly think of to do for the city, for my team, on the deal, you still don't feel part of it. But that moment made me just, like, boo-hoo a little bit. Wow, that's and cool. I, I was the same way as Rock, but that not my home run. That moment was the moment that was like, wow. And they brought Jung Ho Gung out a wheelchair. Oh, wow. For a wild game. I mean, I game. think that's so important. Yeah, though. I like, agree. Yeah. Like, part hey, of the, they're part of we're the, here. Yeah, I mean, you're heck, yeah, you're one of the reasons we are here. <laughs> I appreciate Seriously, that. I mean, that, that's Humbling. the truth. Uh, Hold my cutter is the podcast here at Burn by Rocky Patel, and we are enjoying the uh, featured cigar. Yeah, the white label. Back up. The white label. And for everybody out there, this is called a torch. Oh, and it's a good it's one. It's awesome. Yeah, like a little kid. <laughs> the whole time. You like all these toys I here. I do. I do. But uh, this is this is great stuff here. And talking to Michael McHenry about these moments in his career, including, so I went back and looked for it at, obviously we talked about the home run, the home run. light it up. Mm -hmm. You got him, light him. Uh, this is less than three weeks after your first home run. You're involved in one of the most controversial, controversial moments in Pirates history, uh, that, which is, I cannot believe it was, less than three weeks after that home run at PNC Park that, that beat the Cubs. But in Atlanta, Turner Field, Pirates led 2 to nothing in the first inning, 3 to nothing in the second. I didn't realize it. The reason they were leading 3 to nothing in the second, because you hit your second career home it, run. It took a while. And against uh, Tommy Hansen. I Tommy Hansen. Yes. And I couldn't hit him in the minor leagues. He owned me. And he hung me. A slider and I deposited in the seats. Uh, so it's three to nothing. Yep. I didn't know. 
Hey, Brian, how long that game was, I did not know I hit that homer that game. I thought it was the game before <laughs> for the longest time. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're, in case you didn't realize it, spoiler alert, we're talking about the 19 inning yep. game. The Braves tie it in the third inning with three runs off Jeff Karstens. Yep. Talked about him in a previous episode, but you always like catching Karstens. Why? Because the gamer. He, he was unconventional. I mean, we, we weren't in a time where the velocity was, you know, sitting about 95 on, on league average. But he was kind of the old school approach. We used to call it playing wolf ball in the backyard. Mm. You know, we, we would go into a game, and if his ball was cutting, we played the cut. And he may say, hey, I think I could really do this today. And it'd be something we've never done before, which one day it was a backdoor slider. One day it was a slow curveball. Next day, hey, I'm going to wiggle in this split some today. And I was like, all right, just bounce it, see what happens. We're always adapting to the game. And there's nothing more fun as a catcher than a guy that's out there just trying to figure out a way to compete and win. Because he was a guy that threw really hard at, at one point when he was with the Yankees when he came over. You know, he could touch 94, but he knew the BP fastball played, mm. the good changeup, being able to locate, and he knew his strengths. And having that, you could do a lot of cool stuff. That's why I love Jeff Carson. So really a pitcher. He really was. A definition pitcher. of a pitcher, right? Yeah, like he may drop down, do different things, because he's trying to learn the game and play the game in real time, not just a scouting report. Because that's, that's really just a template to say, this is where these guys are out. This is what you could do, but the game's going to tell you everything as it unfolds. If you don't watch the game and learn the game as you're playing it, you're going to eventually hit a wall and have to take a left or right. This guy was always willing to take that left or right, but in real time. Well, obviously, he got a no decision that night because uh, he gives up the three. To t it ties it at three. And yeah, they didn't let him go that long. No, no, no. They they don't, I don't know why. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, in the uh, I didn't realize this until looking at the box score. But in the top of the ninth inning, I'm trying to think of how many chances the Pirates might have had to regain the lead. Top of the ninth, Michael McHenry, a one-out single toward the shortstop position off Craig Kimbrell. Brandon Wood is next. He singles. You go to third. Eventually, they give Wood second base. So it's second and third with, I think it was Xavier Paul at the plate. And David Ross is catching. Mm -hmm. You get picked off third base. What are you thinking, McHenry? Obviously wasn't thinking. <laughs> How uh, can you get picked off in a tie game in the ninth inning? I got caught in between. And and honestly, if I look back at it, I'm, I'm sure it was a, a squeeze. Or, uh -huh. Well, yeah. that's okay. You yeah. Because uh, I was Statue very, limitations. You can admit it now that it was a squeeze. It, it was. Maybe somebody missed a sign. It wasn't sign. you. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was not you. But yeah, it wasn't me. But it's always you. you know, yeah, you, yeah, I know. You always take responsibility. I remember, I remember but again, taking was... the responsibility on air, and then uh, I think Hurdle or somebody actually brought it up in his interview. And they're like, "Why'd you take the blame?" It's like, "Because I'm a teammate." Good for you. I'm not gonna throw him under the bus. Yeah. 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 So, so Xavier had a hard time with signs. Uh huh. Yeah. A lot of guys. A lot of guys did, but I, I thought. So the squeeze goes awry, <laughs> and. Uh, he ends Just up a teammate on her bus. I'm sorry. No, no. Heck, he, heck, again, statute of limitations. We're talking about 2011, yeah, for goodness years. sake. Good point. Get over it. Anyway, <laughs> you're in the uh, – it's the bottom of the 19th inning, still tied at three. Daniel McCutcheon, who's pitched, I think, five innings to that point in relief. Have we gone into that part of it? We're going to. So he, he – so in terms of the relievers and Daniel yeah, yeah, McCutcheon. Yeah, kind of how it all – What a gamer he was. Unfolded, yeah. So, you know, it's the ninth inning, and – we go into that tent, and he's going around asking guys like, "Hey, man, should I go get my spikes? Should I go get my spikes? Like, I think I'm, I think, I think I'm going to be needed. I think I'm." This is Daniel why, McCutcheon yeah, asking. Yeah, Daniel McCutcheon. He's very high strung. He's like me. He's, he's he's a gamer, and eventually, like, we all just say, "Yeah, go," and all the coaches are like, "No, you're you're down. You've thrown the last three days. You've been up four. No, that's something he had th already thrown the last, last three. three days. And they, we used to call them turf days guys that would not go to the bullpen. They had to stay in their turfs in the, in the actual like normal dugout. They couldn't go out there because okay, stay away from the bullpen. They were not available. Like don't even make it a, don't even go out there. Yeah, not even a thought. Well, he threw on his spikes and ran out there. Did someone suggest that to him? We all, well, the players, it was a player's decision wow. because the coach was saying, no, he ran out there and, Sure, sure enough, Yuki picked up the phone and said, Kutch is ready. Uh, and he won the game. Ended up throwing five in the third inning, I believe. And that's the teammate you'll go, go to war with any day of the week because 
I mean, just zero after zero. Ends up throwing almost as much as Carson did. I mean, think about it. On, Incredible. On three days pitching, four days up. My gosh. So he goes out for that down the bottom of the 19th. He gets uh, Jason Hayward to ground out. Julio Lugo walks. Uh, Jordan Schaefer, I believe it was, singles, mm -hmm. goes to second on defensive indifference. Uh, there's runners at second and third with one out. Scott Proctor is the batter for the Braves, bottom of the 19th inning. Tie game, Pirates and Braves in Atlanta. By the way, were you at all aware prior to that game or since about Devastating losses by the Pittsburgh Pirates in that city in Atlanta. No, you were not, not aware of it at all. You have since been I've made aware, well aware, I'm absolutely. sure. Absolutely. October 14th, of course, 1992, Game 7. Sid Bream scores from second base on the Francisco Cabrera hit that uh, gives the Braves that come from behind win over the Pirates in the NLCS and brings them to the World Series. But anyway, so now here's the ground ball to Pedro Alvarez. Take us, take it from there. You're catching. So First off, Scott Proctor is a pitcher, right? So <laughs> we, we know we have a pretty good chance to get out of this situation, and we get him to roll over and hit a ball right to Pedro. Pedro is playing even with the bag. We're all playing in. He gets the ball, throws me a bullet, and I have a lane. So now it's actual rule, but I'm giving him a lane. Lugo slides probably about seven feet prior to the plate. So I go in, take my jab step, and I kind of swipe tag. Uh, I'm not going to destroy the guy. I mean, if I destroy him, I'm probably going to get hit in the head the next about. So swipe tag him. And I don't even think he's touched the plate. And even, I look up, even today. <laughs> even today. As of today, Julio Lugo. He's still not touched the plate. He's never touched home plate. And Jerry Mills just goes safe. And my heart just drops. Hands go here. And I say, Jerry, you missed it. There's no way. I tagged him. I tagged him. It's like, you missed the tag. And I said, Jerry, you'd be so disappointed in yourself. Like a mom. Is that what you said? Yeah. I was like, I was like <laughs> his mother. That's a way to curse You're be out so an umpire. so yourself when you watch the film. <laughs> you should be disappointed. And, and by that time, Snyder's oh, out. Oh, my God. Hurdle's out. Hurdle pushes Snyder out. Gum comes out of the mouth, and he's this close to Jerry. Well, looking down, because Jerry's oh, tiny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Hurdle's bright red. Man, oh. I mean, bright red, and they kind of pull us all away, and we end up losing that game. I mean, 19 innings, everything that McCutcheon did fighting clawing and this this event was such a devastation to where we were going i felt like it took the morale out of us just completely a gut punch but we went into the locker room and a lot of times people don't know what happens afterwards we're all going nuts guys pissed off hurdle comes in coach staff comes in we have a meeting we're putting the the game under suspension and then kind of putting it under review and hopefully oh, protesting yeah a little yeah. protest um and we didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, from there, you know, I, I'll never forget getting showered up, leaving. We're there forever. It's probably 3.30 in the morning. I get into the tunnel where the family is, and my wife is hot. I'm not talking <laughs> just by the way she looks, Brownie. Yeah. I'm talking she is still like, like Probably this. unlike like, anything you've you ever seen from me. her. She's ducking. She's diving. And she is fired up. She's like, why are you not mad her? I'm like, there's nothing I can do about it. Like, he's just human. And I remember going to sleep that night, and she's still going. Really? Yeah, so fired up. I'm like, man, have we ever switched roles here? Wow, wow. Yeah, she was just so wired about it. And, too, like, Brian, like I grew up an Atlanta Braves fan. That's my first time in Turner. And I have probably 50 to 100 people there randomly, plus family, that came and watched a lot of those games. So, I mean, when I get back in, my phone and – we're not in the new age iPhone era. We're yeah. in okay iPhone yeah. era. And it's just blown up to pieces because it went everywhere. I mean, Martha Stewart's talking about it. It's on <laughs> CNN. It's on Fox. It's everywhere. I mean, my wife ended up flying out the next day um, or maybe two days later, and they're still talking about it. It's on every TV. So it was like it was a huge deal because why? Was that the last game of, of, the, of that series? It was uh, one more game the next day, it was, but it was during the day. We flew out that day. A day game Philly. the next day. We got destroyed in Philly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Fort, so the the play, uh, replay had been introduced in baseball a little earlier, but really only for home runs, foul balls. So uh, looking back, because I've thought about this a lot since 
replay now is in full swing. And soon we'll have the automatic strike zone we'll get into Ooh. at some point. Yeah, that, the little teaser tells you what Ford thinks of it. But do you think, I have an opinion, do you think replay would have overturned that? You remember, so I want to say yes. You want to, your heart I, says yes. My heart says yes, but remember early on with, with the review, they, they kind of had a brotherhood. And they kind of stuck it out with, with, with plays if they could. I don't know how they get around with Lugo not touching home at first. I don't know. There's an, an angle that exists. I, I've seen every angle. I've never seen an angle that actually shows definitively that he did hit home plate. Be, otherwise, that call has to stand. Right. So it'd be interesting to see what happened. And I'll never forget uh, something I don't share often is next time I catch and Joe West is behind the plate, he tells me, hey, next time bury him into the ground. Well, now you can't do that exactly. either. So now we have two rules yep. that Ambiguous. kind of make it impossible to do anything different than what I did. Right. And I was trying to be, you know, a good dude, not destroy this guy because right. baseball is a big family. Yep. And you kind of swipe tag him. And remember, Brian, we're still in the neighborhood play era. That's right. At, at second base. Like, you didn't have well, to touch second base. that's why it was so surprising, by yeah. the way. But back, th back then. Yeah. I just think he had a brain for it. I really yeah. do. Well, what kind of uh, conversations down the road did you have with him when he was either at home plate and you were catching or heck, on the bases? Any at all? I ended up catching almost 300 more games and never had him. Never had him after that? Never. Again, no. incredible twist I, to the McHenry Fort You can't career. make that up. And I felt like every time That's he was incredible. behind the plate and I thought I was catching. Do you think I that was catching. intentional by baseball? I don't know. But if it you're a conspiracy you wonder, theorist, yeah. 300 games and not that. Yeah. Yep, and it's not like I didn't have him. I mean, he was the chief. You know, my last two or three years, he was a chief. Crew so chief, like, yeah. He he was he was the guy that maybe maybe moved himself sometimes. I have no idea. Wow, that's and incredible. I got to talk to him at first base. Always said hello. Um, never never was rude to him. I knew I knew how good of an umpire he was, but he did make a huge mistake. And the biggest thing I say all the time to those umpires is like, own it. Yeah. Like if you own your mistake and say, you know what, I missed it. So Bring for in me, your guys, and I know just respect to Jerry Meals because I've never had a conversation with him. And by the way, he's a local guy, Butler. That that's came the that later on the road too. And, I didn't know. And I felt for years. Now he's no, he retired, but but I felt badly for years because I felt I almost contributed to the fans' ire over the many years that followed, even years when announcements before the game at PNC Park would be <laughs> yeah. made. Here's the umpiring crew, and Jerry Meals were on that crew. He would hear it, the booze. And I felt like, and it was not intentional. My, I never forget my call because I, I, I hear it on occasion. But you've got to be kidding me, Jerry Meals. Yeah. Because I looked down to, to confirm on my scorecard. I, I write down all the umpires, their location. I wanted to be certain that's who it was. And again, not to, in a, in a vitriolic way, but just because that's a fact. He was and. I was on with John Wayner that night, and we just couldn't believe how hard fought that game was and for it to end there on top of everything else. Proctor, the pitcher, slips and falls in the box. So Daniel McCutcheon, the pitcher, unbeknownst to you, is assuming it's an out call. And he is screaming from in front of the mound to you, throw to first because it's an inning-ending double play. Yeah. And in his no, mind. No clue. Right. That he just called him safe. Now, you had over. no clue that he was yelling it because you're t telling him you are, the game's over. He doesn't even look that way. He's yelling at you, throw to first. You're yeah. not aware he's yelling at you. No, I have no clue. Because, I mean, for me, the game just ended in, in, a, in a spectacularly bad fashion. I mean, it, it's something that you never forget. And, Brandon, when I say, like, we fell apart after that, you look at the record, you see how we played in Philadelphia – I mean, we played so bad. It took so much of the win. We had a game the next day that we lost late in the ballgame, too, against the Braves. So it was one of those games that you could look back on and say, well, that was a complete U-turn we took with the motion. The only thing I'm going to say, we the only thing I'll year. say to that, to be fair, I thought about this because fans believe, and that's okay, that that was the turning point that the Pirates would have gone on to a playoff spot had they won that game. It was that meaningful, but that separates baseball from every other sport. You got to turn the page no the doubt. next night and no win doubt. that game. You can't, it's the starting pitcher's momentum, the whole thing. Because the following year, incredibly enough, you're still on the team, 2012, the Pirates play a 19 inning game in St. Louis. 
and beat mm -hmm. the Cardinals, but have the September collapse for the ages in 2012. So a 19-inning win did not catapult the Pirates the following year into the postseason. Yeah. Again, to be fair. Correct. But uh, well, first of all, that was... That was a, a wives' trip, by the way. That was? The, the, yeah. The next I, year? It, it's, it never wow. ceases to amaze me how baseball plays things out. Mm. When things like that, like a 19 in a game, it's it's usually a family trip or, yeah. or something <laughs> where it shouldn't be because it never works out the way it's supposed to. But that game, two guys, went 0 for 8. Me and Matt Holliday. I wasn't going to point that had, out. You I, and Matt Holliday went 0 for 8. I had a home run robbed in that game. What? Yeah. Who yep. robbed you? Grichik. I got Randall to play with Grichik. Him. Yep, I got to play with him. He's like, yeah, I'll never forget that one. He robbed you of a home run. Yep. Yep, it was a. It, it would have been the difference. Oh, well, the Pirates won that game, but we, you, we did. Yeah, you knew it was going to win. The only way that game was going to end, was somebody had a homer. Of course, it was the bull. He hates red. That's incredible. Pedro Alvarez. Um, so, the, we talked about Jerry Meals, and we won't you know, spend. And by the, the way, that had no, you did nothing wrong. I mean, he had to come out and apologize. But that, that, was, was, that was my that was my point. The only the only thing I have an issue with. I'd love to talk to Jerry someday about it. No disrespect to I have the greatest respect in the world because I think they're the best officials of any sport. It's a hard job. Replay has shown yeah. that that they're so they're so good, um, but I, I don't know how contrite he was. He almost seemed a little bit, at least from the quotes, he was reticent to admit a mistake. Even later on, when the league pushed him to say you, you made a mistake, but, but and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. You've yeah. been in the game longer than I have. From my experience, the guys that are willing to say, hey, you're right, I, I missed it. Or even in a game, like, hey, what would you think? I mean, how many conversations I've had catching, and they're asking me, was that a strike? Was that a ball? And, yeah, I could manipulate it, but a lot of the guys I got a favor with because I would tell them the Oh, truth. you know how much more forgiving everyone is, fans, umpires, everyone in the game when you're contrite in, any, in all aspects of life. Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit. Enough said. How about the, the right? difference? One of, guy came out and said, hey, this is what happened. This is why yep. I owned it. Baseball forever loves him. Roger Clemens, you know, a lot of people still despise that man, but they fought for something differently instead of saying, hey, yeah. this is what happened. Yep. Well, and I point this out because uh, a year earlier, June 2nd, 2010, Armando Galarraga pitching against the then Cleveland Indians in Detroit mm -hmm. is one out away from a perfect game. There's a ground ball to the right side. He covers, hits the bag before the ball, before the runner, Jason Donald, arrives. The first base umpire is Jim Joyce. He rules him safe. Perfect game is over. He, it takes Galarraga's name, uh, robs him of an historic perfect game moment. But unlike, again, my belief, and, and maybe not fair to say it because I want to talk to, to Jerry about it, and, and it's not fair that, that we never really saw him on video. It was more of a, just a quote. But, boy, Jim Joyce did exactly what we talked about. He almost immediately said, I blew it. I, I, I ruined history for this guy. I blew it. He kept saying that. But, Fort, what I often think about with replay Replay has taken away moments. So right or wrong, those indelible moments mm -hmm. are gone. Even if it hurts your team, like the Pirates and the Pirates and you, because the next day, Jim Leland, in all of his wisdom, recently, of course, we're going to have Jim on a, a podcast. Of, this is Hold My Cutter, and, and we'll have the now Hall of Fame manager, then of the Detroit Tigers, in his infinite wisdom, he saw fit the next day to give that lineup card to Armando Galarraga. So Galarraga, the pitcher who had that moment robbed of him the previous day, goes out to home plate and meets the umpiring crew. And who is calling balls and strikes that day with that equipment on but Jim Joyce? the man who had made the call the day before. And the two of them shake hands and embrace. And Jim Joyce is visibly shaken, crying. Now that's a moment, not just a baseball moment, societal moment about how it's okay to make a mistake. You can be forgiven. What 
what Amazing. a great baseball lesson that is. Amazing. Life lesson. Yeah, life, life lesson. Baseball take it, that, but that's taken from us because of replay. Yeah, and feel. Like we're going to say that a lot in this in this podcast, is because I think the game has lost a lot of feel because of of technology. Whether it's replay, whether it's analytics, and that moment that Leland said, "This is what needs to happen," gave, in my opinion, Jim Joyce a chance to have his piece, but also at the same time. If, if Colorado is willing to do that, I mean, that moment's really special because they could both move on, mm. right? And it's a moment that will live on forever. And I've had arguments with guys, whether it should be, you know, an asterisk where he gets the perfect game. And I say, no, I like the moment in history way better. Like, keep it as is. He threw a great game. I mean, what he did there is really remarkable. But that moment, I think, in history and everything that surrounds it means See, so I, much more. I argue that we – Okay, players can make mistakes, managers, coaches can make mistakes, fans can make mistakes, broadcasters can make mistakes. The only ones that have to be perfect are the umpires or the officials. I don't, I don't understand that. Why? Why can't they make mistakes? Right, and we always forget what falls in our favor because of one thing that fell oh, out of favor. And by the way, baseball is 162 games for a reason. Right. Because right? mistakes are made and it all evens out. It, it, it's like Don Deckinger, the, the uh, first base umpire, the, the uh, Cardinals and the Royals, uh, game six of that 1985 World Series, ninth inning, one nothing, uh, Cardinals lead it. Uh, Jorge Orta hits that ground ball to first base. Deckinger calls him safe. He should have been out. Outrage. The Royals end up winning that game two to one. That was game six. The Cardinals could have won game seven. They did not. There's always a, there's always a tomorrow, and right. Uh, right. I just I just it bothers me that. That everybody, it, the umpires have to be perfect. Nobody else has to be perfect. Everybody else can make mistakes, but umpires are the ones that have to be perfect. So now at replay, we're going to try and make everything perfect, which it never will be. And, and it's old adage. As a team, I think when you look back at 11 and 12, and we're kind of embracing what's happening now with the Pirates of maybe they're at that, that 12 range. It, it's all about the bounce back. How yeah, can you can right. control the things you can, yeah. not worry about the things you can't, and just move on to the next day. Find those little victories, the little wins. If we looked back at that 2011 game, 19 innings, Brownie, or in St. Louis, and said, man, look at all the things we did well. But then the game we and we ended up losing, then go to St. Louis, look at all the things we did wrong and ended up winning because we should have won that game nine times probably. And that's the fact. Is like We have to reflect and look back at what we need to move on, to grow, learn, and get better. So often we just – we just pile the bad on. Yeah. We focus on that way, instead of bad, like, wait a minute, didn't we win that game? By yeah, the way, we did. The, the bad is okay. It comes yeah, along with the good. good. That's what and makes you enjoy you grow, the good. Right? Yeah. I mean, if somebody didn't miss a suicide squeeze bunt that day, the Pirates might have won it in nine innings. And uh, he, will, he will remain nameless from this point forward. But again, that's a chance the Pirates would have won it. And we wouldn't be talking. We're talking about that right. st still to this day. Right. about that 19 inning game hey we've got uh, just w one more moment in your career uh your pirate career finishes up in 2013 july 27th you played 41 games that year i'll never forget it for it because we could see that you had hurt your knee badly turns out we didn't know it was a torn meniscus in the seventh inning but talk about why you guys love guys like daniel mccutcheon and others gamers how about that moment that not many people know about how did you hurt it uh, sliding into second, breaking up a double play, and not not the double play breakups nowadays where yeah. you, you can't Again, make contact. Right, You're right. talking about you go in, and if you break up the double play, they don't make the throw or they fall down, you get high fives yeah. You know, in the dugout. And that's the way the game should be played. Yeah. My opinion, I never want to put people in harm's way, but this time he did a really good job, kind of deked me a little bit and kind of pulled back last second. So I hit the bag, my knee hits, and I feel it tear immediately. And the problem was, if it tore, I would have been fine. Maybe it floated around, but it got caught underneath my kneecap. My leg got stuck and just happened to be a four-hit game. I, I just started playing a little bit more. Uh, Russell and myself Russell went, yeah, went into Hurdle's office, and Russell was exhausted. Hmm. He was playing too much and pretty much talked uh, Hurdle and the coach staff into, hey, we need to play this guy more so I'm not beat up. And he was hurt at the time, so... Um, so the starting up. catchers hurt that day. Yep, that day. You the backup, and you knowing that, you know that Martin, it, 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 
you, you need to play, and despite the fact you knew you had done some major damage to your knee, a catcher goes out there and then catches uh, after getting hurt in the, in the top of the seventh inning. That was, I can't imagine the pain you must have been in every time you'd get into that catcher's crouch. <laughs> With a torn <laughs> meniscus. I could keep it bent. Um, it was straightening it out. So, like, I started, I threw from my knees. Um, blocking wasn't very fun, but um, the only thing I was thinking about is if I get through this game, maybe, just maybe, I'll be okay. Pretty much knowing I wouldn't be. But, yeah, I, I told Benny, we, as soon as I came off the field after the slide, Jeff Bannister are was Are you okay? Are you okay? Coach. And I said, I'm stuck. My knee's stuck. And we go down the tunnel, and we're yanking on that thing, trying to unlock it. Doesn't unlock. He's like, can you go? Hurdle's yelling down. What's the word? And Martin puts on his gear, not knowing. And I'm like, I'm good. I got it. I just ran out and made it work. And we ended up winning the ball game. I think I had to catch Tony Watson. Joel, was a, I think Tony Watson and Grilly at the time. Maybe it was Tony Watson, Melanson and Grilly. I don't remember who it was, but uh, kind of blacked out a little. But special moment for me to just finish the game because I always said I always wanted to finish. Never, if I was able to, I wanted yeah. to finish. One time I got pulled off field because of blood, um, and I was so mad. Um, but, yeah, if I was able to play physically and, and not put my team in a bad place, I wanted to. Last game of your Pirates career. Last game. Incredible. Yeah. Here's to you. Yeah. Fort, thank you, sir. Thanks for the, yeah. thanks for the coffee mugs, yeah. by the way. And thanks for tuning in, as always, to Hold My Cutter. And thanks to the great folks here at Burn by Rocky Patel. An incredible story, uh, the Michael McHenry Fort story. Hey, Fort. Hold my cutter. Think about it like that, Brian, right there. That's, right. That, that's the cutter I'm, I'm thinking right. about. All right. Right.